it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas, whether we are ready or not. Thank you for taking the time out of a busy holiday season to join us at Dayspring Fellowship as we celebrate the reason we celebrate, Jesus. I'm Chris Voigt, and I lead the pastoral team here at Dayspring. In every season, our team here is committed to helping you grow in your relationship with Jesus. Whether you are here in the room or watching online, live or on demand at some point in the future. Our prayer for this service is that God would meet you in the deepest places of your heart as he fills you with love, joy, peace, and hope in a world that desperately needs more love, joy, peace, and hope. We also pray that you find Dayspring the kind of church that you can call home. We are really more of a family. We're the kind of people who will welcome you with open arms, just as you are. Nobody here has their act completely together, so don't think you need to either. This is a safe place to check out the claims of Jesus. It's a safe place to have doubts and questions about spirituality. We like helping people figure out the next steps on their journey. So if you haven't arrived yet, whatever that means for you, welcome. You can learn more about us as a church by exploring our website at dsf.church, by checking out our Facebook page, or contacting us by phone or email. If you need help figuring out the next step to making Dayspring your church home, or if you just have questions, let us know. We'll help you find the answers. For today's service, you can find study questions by selecting Watch from the top menu of our website. And now, let's join our service. enough breath to do that. And a very Merry Christmas to you too, buddy. <laughs> Here you go, Henry. Can I warm that coffee up for you, sugar? No, I'm fine. No, I didn't ask how you look today, Henry. I asked if you'd like some more coffee. Now, Velma, if you talk like that, you're gonna warm up more than my coffee. <laughs> oh, Henry. <laughs> oh, good morning, boys. Is it already time for your second mid-morning coffee break? <laughs> Slow and steady wins the race, Velma. Well, Bert, you boys got it locked up then. <laughs> Morning, Nadine. Did you get home late last night? No, I wouldn't say I got home late. Well, from the looks of you, I wouldn't say you made it home at all. You must be going for the Walk of Shame Hall of Fame. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, miss. Oh, the only thing you missed, darling, is my name. It's Velma. Show you stool. I beg your pardon? A stool. All my tables are full, so a stool's all I've got, unless you want to get it to go, and then you can take it and eat it wherever you want. Oh, <laughs> no, thank you. I'm not here to eat. Uh, smart girl. Watch it, Henry. You might just get a check today. <laughs> well, darling, if I can't feed you, what can I do for you? I'm from the Fountain of Grace Memorial Church, and I wanted to see if I could place a poster in your window. Oh, well, I don't see why not. What are you selling, baked goods or raffle tickets, bingo? <laughs> no, <laughs> it's an advertisement for our annual Christmas pageant. We've never advertised in this part of town before and thought that it might help. Oh, well, I've always said what we really need around here is a good Christmas pageant. <laughs> Let's see what we've got here. Okay, Because Tree Lives, a musical celebration. It's a living Christmas tree. You don't say. Mm -hmm. I saw the living Christmas tree a couple years ago. Oh. It was some kind of pretty. Yeah. There must have been 100 people. 125. They're all dressed in green. Match the tree. And they had red balls on their head and icicles hanging from it's their ears. It's a moving experience. Oh, I'm getting kind of woozy just hearing about it. Excuse me? <laughs> oh, nothing, sugar. So you'll display the poster? Well, I don't see why not. But you know, if you really want some help, we can do a lot more than just put a poster in the window. 
How do you mean? Well, some of the most talented people in town walk right through that door. Oh. <laughs> Absolutely. Nobody sings harmony better than the Spencer twins. Uh, Velma, uh, they're locked up because of the fight? Oh, yeah. Well, they'll be out in five days. Nadine here, she can sing and dance better than Beyonce. Be be beyond what? Beyonce. You know, all the single ladies, all the single ladies, all the single ladies. Oh, 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 oh. And my niece sings like an angel. Well, as soon as uh, tongue heals from the piercing. Well, and I can play the spoons. Really? A poster in the window is more than enough from you people. Come again. More than enough from you people. I don't mean to be rude. It's just that we thought it would be real nice if you pe we thought it would be real nice if other people were allowed to come to watch the celebration, but we never dreamed that you'd be a part. Now, surely you're not saying that we're good enough to come to your program, but not good enough to be in your program. Now, I didn't exactly say that exactly. Well, if I wasn't exactly the opposite kind of woman that you think I am, I wouldn't exactly tell you where you could put your poster. <laughs> but for now, I think it's just best that you stick a bowl on it and shove it under your living Christmas tree. She's <laughs> got some nerve. Yeah, talk about nerve. Don't worry about it, Velma. She deserved it. Not her, you dipstick. Who does she think she is telling us that we're not good enough to climb some tree and stick a ball on our head and sing about Christmas? Yeah, I climbed a tree once and I, I put a pumpkin on my head, but I didn't sing. Uh, well, uh, Velma, you need to calm down. Uh, she may be right. What? Well, let's face it, we are not church folk. Me and the boys like to play cards, have a beer or two. And uh, Nadine knows her way around more than a dance floor. <laughs> and you never told us much about your past. Well, I'm not saying that we're perfect, Henry, but I do think that we're good enough to celebrate Christmas. Well, that's And that's just what we're going to do. What's that, sugar? We're going to celebrate Christmas right here in the diner. We'll show that Fountain of Grace Memorial Church. We'll serve up Christmas Velma style, served with a smile. <laughs> they can just stick that in their window and look at it. <laughs> All right, now I got lots to do. We're going to celebrate Christmas. Well, welcome, friends. Uh, whether you are here in the room or joining us online, we are glad you're here. Uh, we're at the end of November. Can, can you believe it? The end of November. Thanksgiving has passed, and we can now officially play Christmas music, although I may or may not have already been listening to it on the radio. As you can see, I'm wearing my ugly Christmas dress to start the season right. Now... I apologize if you own this same dress and think it's cute. Actually, every year I wear this one particular Christmas sweater that I consider an ugly Christmas sweater and I get compliments and I'm not quite sure what to do with that. In fact, today, all of you ladies who complimented me on my dress, thank you. <laughs> I wanna welcome you to the first of five messages that will take us almost to the end of the year. This is the official beginning of our 2021 Christmas series called An Unexpected Christmas. We have chosen a framework from Pastor Andy Stanley that will help us take a fresh look at what Christmas is really all about. You know, besides ugly Christmas attire and presents and stuff. But before we begin, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you in humble adoration of the glory that you are. We thank you, Lord, for this season, uh, not because of the hustle and the bustle and the lights and the beauty, but because of the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. And so um, may we open our hearts and our minds this morning to be drawn nearer to you this season. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, we know that Christmas is not about the decor or the music, the presents and such. It's about Jesus. 
And today we're going to take a peek into the book of Matthew and unpack some things that maybe we haven't really thought about before or maybe we have and we get to revisit and refresh our hearts and minds on the subject. When you look at the New Testament, it begins with four books that we call the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And these books are about the life and the ministry of Jesus. When comparing these four books, we see that some accounts of Jesus' ministry are similar and some are different. Some include certain things and others include other things. For instance, Mark and John start roughly 30 years after Jesus' birth with the ministry of John the Baptist. Matthew and Luke both talk about the birth of Christ, but Luke begins with the announcement of the upcoming birth of John the Baptist, while Matthew is the only gospel that doesn't start with a story per se, but starts with the genealogy of Jesus. In fact, if you're reading the book of Matthew for the first time, you might see all this genealogy information in the first 16 verses and decide to just skip that part. You know, kind of like some of the Old Testament books where they're filled with genealogy and we just kind of skip over all that and get to the meat of the book. Don't look so surprised, I bet you've done it too. Anyway, Matthew's gospel begins with all these names and who is the father of who and eventually gets to the Christmas story. He begins like this. This is a record of the ancestors of Jesus the Messiah, a descendant of King David of Abraham. Now, note when we are referring to Jesus the Christ, Christ and, Christ and Messiah are interchangeable Hebrew and Greek terms. And verse 2 in the very first chapter of Matthew says, And Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac was the father of Jacob, and Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. And he goes on and on, beginning with Abraham and continuing right up to Jesus. Now, is it sacrilegious to say that genealogy is just not that interesting to me? And and, and why would he start this book like this anyway? Well, actually... There are are a couple of really important reasons that he begins with the ancestry of Jesus. First, he's writing to a Jewish audience and is about to make the case that Jesus is, in fact, the Son of God, the Messiah. The first question that this Jewish audience would have asked before they even considered Jesus to be the Messiah would be, is Jesus related to David? Because... If he wasn't, that would be a thing, a bad thing. Because God had said that the promised Messiah would be a descendant of David. And if this Jesus guy was supposedly it, he'd better be related to David. So Matthew, the smart guy that he is, answers the question first, creating credibility for everything else that he will be writing in this book. But there's something interesting in this list of Jesus' ancestry. Now remember that this is written to a Jewish audience and this genealogy should have included males only. But look, Matthew throws some estrogen into the mix. In in verses 3 through 6, he includes four women, and he also includes other names that in these times and circumstances wouldn't have been important for this particular list. So let's look at Matthew 1, 3 through 6. Judah was the father of Perez, and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron was the father of Ram. Ram was the father of Aminadab, say that quick ten times. Aminadab was the father of Nashon. Nashon was the father of Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother was Bathsheba, the widow of Uriah. Now, here is an interesting point. In ancient times, the only histories that were written down were the ones that were written by hired historians. 
In fact, when you were in school and studied ancient history, especially before the first century and around the second century, most of the histories we have were written by people who were hired to make them look good. So, consequently, there are gaps. And these writers would make a big deal out of military successes and then they would downplay defeats. They make a big deal out of the sons who did amazing things and little or no deal about those who didn't do something spectacular. A trophy clear, clearly went to the winner. There were no participation trophies here. Anyway, all this creates gaps in the accurate documentation of genealogy. And in addition, most often people who wrote histories were writing with a specific point in mind. I mean, remember they were hired, so the stories usually made the one who hired the historian look good. So we have this list that Matthew brings up, and it includes not only women, but the names of people that he didn't even need to mention. And this list should have been all men, but he included these four women. And two of these women he probably shouldn't have mentioned at all, considering their sordid past. Three of the four women weren't even Jewish, which would also be odd because the Messiah had to come from a Jewish line of descent. In verse 3, Matthew introduces us to Tamar. And John's going to talk more about that next week, so stay tuned. It's definitely a dicey story. Matthew continues on, and pretty soon, very soon actually, in just two verses later, we see another woman, Ruth. Ruth. Now that's a good story. Even so, a Jewish person would know that Ruth was not Jewish, which would definitely be a problem. Because remember, Matthew was speaking to the Jews, and if they were going to believe that Jesus was the Messiah, he would have to be part of Jewish descent. And they would also expect that there would be no scandal in this ancestry of the coming Messiah. So why is Matthew, while trying to convince the readers of Jesus' divine lineage, bring up scandalous and non-Jewish women? And why leave out other important women like Sarah and Rebecca and Leah, just to name a few? A few more verses, and Solomon's mother is mentioned. Why is that? Why not just stick with the men? And look who this gal is. Solomon's mother was none other than Bathsheba. And if you aren't familiar with David and Bathsheba, it's a story of infidelity and murder. Not exactly the kind of thing a hired historian would have included if you want to make the family look good. So why even record this? Why are not only women, but sex and murder, sin and scandal included in this account of Jesus' genealogy? Why not just include the righteous Jewish ancestors? That would be so much more convincing to the readers that Jesus was legit. After all, it would have been all about righteousness, right? Well, maybe he includes real people who are sinful and broken because Matthew had spent three years with Jesus and knew that that's what he was all about. This disciple saw Jesus die on a cross. He heard Jesus teach, and he knew that all the no-goods and the misfits that Jesus loved, the ones he loved enough to die for. Matthew knew that sin was the issue to be addressed, and this was the point of the story. He knew firsthand that this story is about the light of Christ dispelling the darkness of the world, about life coming to overpower death, and that this was a story about the grace of God that could and would penetrate the walls created by legalism. It's a story about forgiveness, forgiveness in a world that only knows condemnation. Could this be why Matthew decided to include these shady characters? The characters who probably represent you and me better than any of the other righteous people on this list of ancestors? Matthew knew because he was part of the story the reason Jesus came. Matthew, 
the tax collector, collector knew firsthand what it meant to be redeemed and restored by a relationship with Jesus the Messiah. So, fast forward to where Matthew meets Jesus. But before he tells the story of how he met Jesus, he tells a different story. The story took place in Capernaum. Now, Capernaum is a little town on the coast of the Sea of Galilee, which is basically like a, a giant lake. And they called it a sea because, well, it was like an ocean. And one day, as Jesus and his disciples got off the boat in the city of Capernaum, a group came and met them there. And they bring with them a lame man on a mat. Let's skip to Matthew 9, verses 1 through 8. Jesus climbed into a boat and went back across the lake to his own town. Some people brought to him a paralyzed man on a mat. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, Be encouraged, my child. Your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of the religious law said to themselves, That's blasphemy. Does he think he's God? Jesus knew what they were thinking, so he asked them, why do you have such evil thoughts in your hearts? It is easier to say your sins, is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up and went home. Fear swept through the crowd as they saw this happen, and they praised God. God for giving humans such authority. Now here Matthew is establishing that Jesus has the power to heal and the authority to forgive sins and that God himself gave Jesus the authority. In the next verse, enter Matthew. Later Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home. As the dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners, but when the Pharisees saw this, they asked the disciples, why? Oh, let me back up just a little bit. So Jesus approaches Matthew, sitting at a tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Matthew got up and followed him. And now, we don't know the exact timing between verses 8 and 9, but the order of events in this account make the point of establishing what Jesus came to do, to forgive sins. And this would be important to Matthew because he needed that forgiveness. He was a tax collector. Tax collectors were not well-liked individuals. In fact, they were hated. They were hated because they overcharged their fellow Jews and lined their own pockets. The greedier the tax collector, the more taxes the people had to pay. Let me explain. The Romans imposed an income tax, land tax, wine tax, grain tax, fruit tax, boundary, road, bridge, and harbor taxes. Everywhere you went in the Roman Empire, there were taxes. And if Rome needed more money, they just raised the taxes in all the areas that they controlled. And these taxes had to be collected. So the Romans sold the rights to collect these taxes to individuals, the tax collectors. These rights were sold at, at five-year intervals. But the Romans had a problem. Whenever they went into Jewish territory, obviously they weren't very popular. They may even be, uh, there may even be retaliation against these tax collectors. So in order to solve the problem, the Romans recruited Jews to collect the taxes in Jewish areas. Now, whoever had the right to collect the taxes also had the right to set up their own fee schedules. So they would add to the taxes whatever they thought was necessary to compensate themselves for the trouble of collecting taxes. They would contact, or contract out to sub-collectors the responsibility for collecting and raising the different taxes in various areas. And these subs would set up fee schedules. Jews got in on the action even though it meant using Rome's authority to steal. Now, this was about the worst thing that a Jewish man could do. 
not only were you betraying your nation, you were betraying your God. And you were a total traitor and an outcast, the lowest of the low. And they were, in essence, licensed thieves. Any Jewish man who took up the tax collector lifestyle would be excluded from all religious life with the Jewish community. They were considered the lowest form of sinner. There were sinners, and then there were tax collectors, the worst of the worst. That's who Matthew was, a tax collector, an embarrassment to his family, the lowest of the low on the totem pole. He was ostracized from all religious life, and he was not allowed in the synagogue. He was never ceremonial, ceremonially clean enough to go into the temple. His only friends were other tax collectors and sinners. And here he sits in his booth collecting taxes, or more accurate, stealing from his fellow Jews. And up walks the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. Now, I got to wonder, what was going through his mind at that moment? I mean, he gets up and follows Jesus, so something's happening inside of him for sure. And what's going through the mind of the disciples? They were probably thinking, this is going to be super awkward. What are people going to think now that we have this guy tagging along? And it gets worse. Now, we jump into Matthew 9, 10, and 11. Later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as, the, as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. But when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? Jesus and his disciples gather with Matthew's friends, the sinners and the tax collectors, the low and the lower. And I imagine that this was quite a shindig, as Matthew was probably rolling in the dough and putting on a pretty good party. I mean, he had money, but not the right kind of friends. The religious people and the righteous people gather outside, and they don't dare go in or touch anything inside, because this would make them ceremonially unclean. These do-gooders ask the disciples, what the heck? On one hand, your Jesus talks about the righteousness of God, and on the other hand, he's eating with tax collectors and sinners. Remember that these religious people would have never associated with known sinners, especially out in the open. I mean, their gig was to hang out with like kind and not to lower themselves into the pit of where real humanity lives. They would have never had eaten at Velma's diner. Jesus gets wind of the conversation between the disciples and the right fighters. And in verses 9 through 12, he says, When Jesus heard this, he said, Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. And then he added, Now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. For I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. Here at Dayspring, we don't consider our church to be a cruise ship. We consider it a hospital ship. A cruise ship is on vacation, living the high life, escaping from reality. But the reality is that we are all in need of help. A hospital ship is filled with people who need help. Velma's diner was filled with people who need help. Matthew's dinner party was filled with people who need help. The real shocker to the righteous ones outside was that Jesus did not consider being a sinner a disqualifier for inclusion. Jesus hung out with sinners. Why? Because they needed help. They needed Jesus. We need help. We need Jesus. We need the saving grace of Jesus Christ. We need his forgiveness and to recognize that we are not all that. Scripture says that apart from Jesus, we are nothing. And I believe that Matthew understood 
that Jesus called him because he was a sinner. He understood that Jesus came to do the unexpected. He didn't come to be righteous and pious, but to gather those who were the unloved, the outcast, the unrighteous, and draw them into a saving faith in himself. Could that be why Matthew included others who fit that category in the genealogy of Jesus? Including sinners wasn't just a deviation from the norm. It was the norm for Jesus. It wasn't an exception. It was the rule for Jesus. It was the point. It was the point because Matthew had seen Jesus live it out right before his very eyes. It was the mission of Christ. He didn't come for those who didn't need a physician. He came for those who are sick. Matthew understood this probably more than most. Remember, he was a tax collector, the lowest of the low. Matthew understood that the story about God drawing near to those who had drawn away is what Christmas is all about. Christmas is about God drawing near and leaning in towards those who have leaned away from him. Christmas is about leaning in toward those who, because of things they had no control over, or family situations, or lack of knowledge, or whatever it might be, find themselves leaning away from God. Matthew understood that he needed to highlight the problems in the genealogy because they represented the very people Jesus came to save. In the three years that, Jesus, that Matthew spent with Jesus, he discovered that when Jesus came, he changed the rules in terms of what it meant to approach God. Matthew and his friends thought much like we do today. We have this tendency to think that we approach God on the basis of what we have done right or what we have done wrong, what I have done that I am supposed to do or what I have done that I should not have done. Am I good or bad? Matthew knew that if this was really the case, he could never approach God. But what Matthew discovered in his three years with Jesus, by watching him, by standing beside the cross, by standing before a resurrected Savior, was that the rules had changed. From now on, he, a tax collector, a sinner, a man who had failed in every way, broken every law, had the opportunity to approach God. Not on the basis of what he'd done or not done, or, but on the basis of what Jesus had done for him. The rules had changed and sinners and the genealogy were the point. They were the point because God had not come for those who felt like they had a standing because of their own righteousness. God had come for those who knew they needed a different standard altogether. The standard was not for those who would do well, but for those who had done so poorly that they needed a gift. The gift of righteousness. The gift based on what God, through Christ, had done on our behalf. That is the message in the story that this disciple was about to tell in the Gospel of Matthew. It was the story of God drawing near to those who had drawn away. And God had drawn nearer to those who'd been away from him. And I just wonder what Matthew was thinking as he wrote those unexpected outcast names. Maybe he figured that he had to create a gap that would cause questions as to who Jesus really, what, really is. We're going to look at some of those characters, and some of them you will have heard about, some you might not know at all. Chances are you might not know the story of Judah and Tamar. Perhaps there are details of some of these other stories you've missed, and why in the world at Christmas time would we focus on these people, these things? It's because when the angel announced the birth of Jesus, the angel announced him as the savior of the world. 
Savior from what? Savior from sin. That's the point of Christmas, that God sent a Savior. And so the genealogy is the perfect launch to the Christmas story because it highlights the world's need of a Savior. So whether you are a religious person or not a religious person, if you are a Christian or not, this is for all of us. It, it doesn't matter what religion you were raised in or if you weren't raised in any religion. Maybe you have never even set foot in a church or maybe you grew up in church and have landed in that place where you think, that's just not for me anymore. Whatever your background is, this is an all skate for us. Now, I used to skate a lot when I was in junior high. Uh, that's what they used to call middle school. Anyway, every roller skating session has different opportunities for different people. There are usually a couple of songs for fast skaters and a couple of songs for beginners, um, not near enough songs for the couple skate. Uh, keep in mind I was in middle school and that was, you know, a big deal to skate with that really cute guy for two whole songs. Um, not that he ever asked me, but you know, a girl can dream. Anyway, all skate was the time where everyone could skate. So whatever your background is, this is an all skate. Everyone's included. And this is our goal for us. That if you are still a person who approaches God in your mind, or in your perspective, or in your worldview, in any way that is based on what you uh, perceive to be, what you have done or not done, our goal for you is the, in the next few weeks that you would abandon this completely. Because no matter how good you are, no matter how consistent you have been in your walk with God and in, in your behavior or whatever it is that you think is going to draw you near to God, make God more approachable because of your righteousness. It's really not about you. It's about him. It's not good enough. It's just not good enough. And I've got to tell you that in my life, there's been a lot done right and much more done wrong. I am inconsistent. I have things in my life that have, have, I've been incredibly ashamed of. Thankfully, with good counseling over the years, my train load of baggage has been minimized to a fanny pack. I, I was raised in dysfunction junction, and, and there's so much that one would consider wrong if I use these things to measure my worth or my ability to approach God. I wouldn't even try. And it's so easy for us to use our crap to measure his approachability. The truth is, he's approachable because of his love for us, regardless of our crap. And yes, I am using that word because that's just exactly what it is. The story of Christmas is the story of Jesus coming down and redeeming all that stuff that comes between us and God. All of the sin and the shame and the ugly in our lives and teaching us that we can be beautiful and healed because of what Jesus did on the cross. Our goal is that we can all be in the place where we can, with a clear conscience, say, God, in my prayers, in my thoughts, in my perspective, in my worldview, I am not coming to you based on anything other than the fact that Jesus has done something for me that I believe that Jesus has the authority given to you to forgive my sins and to redeem my junk. This is a much more difficult transformation than you might think. In fact, the more religious you are, the more difficult it is to abandon the concept that I, I don't approach God because of who I am. I approach God because of who he is. Perhaps that's why the tax, tax collectors and the sinners weren't the ones who crucified Jesus. Andy Stanley says it this way. 
Perhaps this is why it was the ta wasn't the tax collectors and sinners or even really the Romans that crucified our Savior. It was the men and women that believed somehow they had, a, had an approach to God that could be justified based on their goodness. It was a group that never understood this verse. I have not come to call the self-righteous. I have come to call sinners. I have not come to call those who think they have to earn their way through their goodness and consistency. I have come for those who recognize that no amount of good human works will ever justify a man or woman before God and that the ability to approach God relationally is a gift and has nothing to do with the personal act of righteousness. So as Matthew wrote this genealogy, how could he resist including failures? It was the failures and the sinners that were and still are the point of the story of Christmas. So my prayer for you and for us is that in these next few weeks, by the end of Christmas season, that we would have a new perspective, that we would be liberated from a false sense of righteousness and a hopeless sense of unrighteousness. That we would be a group of people who would live out our faith daily in such a way that we know that we can approach the throne of grace with confidence. Not because what we have done, but because of what he has done. Because that, my friends, is the story of Christmas. Let's pray. Heavenly, God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the story of Christmas. We thank you that your son, Jesus Christ, came for us, broken, sick, impure, imperfect sinners. And that you sent Jesus Christ that we could be redeemed and healed and made righteous through him. God, may we not take that for granted for those who have never met you yet. God, I pray that this moment you are piercing their soul in a way they've never felt. A curiosity and a desire to know the freedom of a relationship in Jesus Christ is burning in their heart. And if that's you, all it takes is God, just pray this prayer with me. God, I want a relationship with you. I want to know what it, what it means to have Jesus in my heart. I want to, I confess I can't do this on my own. I, I, I confess I do it wrong, that I mess up. But I want you to take the reins of my life and help me to make it right. And in Jesus' precious holy name, all the people said, Amen. Once again, thank you for joining us in worship today. Please reach out if you have any questions or want help on your spiritual journey. My email address is on the screen or you can call the church during the week. For those of you who make this ministry possible with your financial giving, thank you for your generosity and faithfulness. We know God is doing something in you when you give, but he also does something through you. If you are just checking us out today, please know that we don't expect you to give anything to support Dayspring. That is the responsibility of our Dayspringers. Just enjoy the rest of your day. If you'd like to start giving, we have three easy ways for you to get us your gift. Please see the online giving section of our website or text GIVE to the number on your screen or mail a check to us at the address you'll find on our website. Also, thank you for liking and sharing and following Dayspring on whatever platform you are on. It means a lot to me when you pass on the good news of Jesus to your friends and family. Until next week, may you experience God's favor and blessing in your life.